Now, a couple words about our, our moderator and our awesome graduate assistant of the Writers Institute and shuttling our writers from train stations <laughs> to airports, Christy O'Callaghan Loya. Mm -hmm. She's completing her master's degree. Yeah. Christy is completing her master's degree in English and she serves as editor-in-chief of Barzak. If you don't know of it, you can find it online. It's B-A-R-Z-A-K-H. It's a fantastic literary journal uh, run by our UAlbany graduate students. Mm -hmm. She's also published several essays, short stories. Please welcome Christy and we'll turn it over to her. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? totally turned it on. It just took a second for it to click in. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. So welcome this afternoon. Uh, very excited. I've been trying to really hold in my fangirling like all day that I've been shuttling um, Jennifer Egan around. So just to give a really quick introduction because honestly you can Google all of this about her online. But she's the author of seven novels and a short story collection. I think seven books altogether. I yeah, think. six novels and a short story. Collection. Yeah, I counted. Um, um, <laughs> um, her 2017 novel, Manhattan Beach, was a New York Times bestseller, was awarded the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction, um, was awarded the, oh, what else? Uh, was chosen for the, I never say this one, I practice this so many times too, the New York City's one book, one New York Read. I don't know why that just doesn't roll off the tongue for me, but it doesn't, but it's very cool. Her previous novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad, won the 2011 Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Circle Award, and was recently named one of the best books of the decade by Time Magazine and Entertainment Weekly. It's also, by the way, I don't know if you know this, listed in James, James Mustick's 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die. I have that book and it's in there so it's very cool her new novel the candy house which is a sibling to a visit from the goon squad I like the way that that's said I think it's very interesting um, was named one of the New York Times 10 best books of 2022 and one of President Obama's favorite reads of the year she also com recently completed a term as president of Pet America which I want to make sure we get to before we wrap up this is a craft talk, so this is going to be real crafty today. So I'm very excited about it. I have tons of craft questions myself. I know we have a lot of students in the room who probably have questions that are similar, but you are going to get a chance to ask them as well at the end. So if I miss anything, please ask it. All right. So we're going to start with what inspired you to write fiction, like why fiction? Was there a specific book, a teacher, a, a writer that you were really interested in? Because you also do journalism. So why fiction? Well, I, 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 I was already writing fiction and had been for a while before I ever wrote any journalism. Mm -hmm. So it definitely came first. But it is an interesting question and it's so fundamental and I had a moment of panic when I heard you asking it because I thought, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. <laughs> um, I guess I haven't been asked that in a while. I think, I think the answer is that, first of all, they, they are such different things. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way it's not really a choice between those two in the sense that at least for me, with fiction, I'm I am inventing the world that I end up writing about. And with journalism, I'm distilling facts and information from the external world mm -hmm. and trying to present those to the general reader. So they're both you know, wonderful things, and I'm grateful to be able to do both. But the journalism really should not involve inventing. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> it does. And those journalists are not doing what they should be doing. And mm -hmm. sometimes they are you know, exposed for having invented. And it can be very tempting to invent because real life often doesn't fit into the story arcs that we want. And we don't find that perfect character out in the real world mm -hmm. who lets us write about all the things we want to write about. So, you know, that's where journalists become tempted to create like a composite character and things like that. But for me, the, the process of discovery of another world that doesn't actually exist is so thrilling because it, it enables that 
kind of transcendent feeling of living in two worlds at once. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the word transcendent is kind of loaded. It has a, a spiritual overtone, but I don't think that's misplaced here. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, and I'm not a person who has really a, a formal religion per se, for me, the feeling of writing and and dis and finding that I things are happening on the page that are I'm not predicting that are just sort of occurring um, because my method is very improvisational um, and then the larger feeling of this kind of secret world that I'm inhabiting for part of every day that only I know about is really as close to a sense of spiritual fulfillment that as I know. And while I love journalism, it doesn't give me that feeling. So we are bre I'm breaking my questions down to a couple of different mm -hmm. categories. And that, you started us on some of them with your process. And that's what I want to focus on first. I don't know about anybody else who has read uh, Goon Squad and Candy House and thought, what does your writing space look like? Because in my mind, reading these books with all these different plot lines and stories and characters, that it's covered in a bunch of different colored post-it notes and, and thumbtacks and like string connecting things to things. That's just my mind and where it goes. I'm sure it's actually much neater <laughs> than what my brain's doing right now. But I'm curious how your process works. How do you get all of these different um, stories and, and everything connected to each other so seamlessly? It's, it doesn't have all those elements. Like, <laughs> I mean, I do love post-its, and I have been told I need a post-it intervention, but I don't use them for that exactly. Mm -hmm. I use them more practically. Um, no, you know, somehow, my big, I think the reason that I don't have all of that gird, physical girding is that I, I don't really rely too much, at least in the creation process, on a lot of external scaffolding. In mm -hmm. other words, I'm, I really do rely heavily on intuition and discovery in the creative process. So, for example, I mean, with Avisa from the Goon Squad, I didn't even initially know I was writing a book when I started mm -hmm. writing those stories. So I really bumbled into it. And once I knew I was writing a book, in a way, the three defining qualities of that book were already set. Each chapter would be have a different protagonist because they were freestanding stories. Mm -hmm. Each chapter would stand on its own. I was writing stories, so they had to. Um, and each chapter would have its own technical and, and craft approach because that's what I always do with short stories. So when I realized they were part of one book, I thought, oh, this will be cool. It'll be a book that feels like lots of different books and yet they'll all fit together into one story. But I really stumbled on that mm. as, a, as a goal. And so the connectedness among the people, again, came about very, um, I don't want to say accidentally, but through trial and error, as opposed to some kind of grand plan in which I created a lot of connections and then enacted them in fiction. Mm -hmm. With the Candy House, I, some things I already knew. I, I was pretty sure I would adhere to those three structural ideas because mm -hmm. I felt like they still gave me a lot of freedom and they seemed like a good way to um, connect the books and sort of lean into the strengths of Goon Squad without hopefully writing the same book. Um, the one guide that I did need, and it, there was color coding involved, so no string or post-its but colors, was just a very careful log of when people were born mm -hmm. and what age they are at every single point. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean every story that already existed in Goon Squad, every sort of foray that I was, attempt that I was making with Candy House, and I say attempt because there's a very high failure ratio with these books, a lot of material I, I end up not being able to use, and then also just what age everyone is in every decade. And I started keeping these logs right from the beginning when I was working on Candy House, which was actually 2010. So the first age um, logs that I have stop very early, at least to my eye now, um, because I was actually working on that book really on and off through from 2010 to 2020. 
one. Wow. Um, and then the, you know, the timeline goes into the future because in Candy House I go into the 2030s. So that was really important because sometimes I would have an idea about characters intersecting and then I would realize, wait a minute, they're not, they're not really the same generation. So mm -hmm. yeah, they can intersect, but how? And is that really natural? There, there's a, a big danger of cuteness with <laughs> sort of reuniting people. Mm -hmm. And I was very wary of that. In fact, one of my working titles for Candy House was No Reunions. So I think maybe that was just a reminder to myself that this was not going to be a reunion book. Right. Um, I really, really, I mean, there's a time and a place for those. The Big Chill is a great movie. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. I, I want to add to what you're talking about here because your website is amazing. And I think you're, and has anybody actually seen Jennifer's website at all? I'm oh. so glad you're calling attention to it. Uh, yeah, don't take out your phones now. But later on, go on and check out Jennifer Egan's website. It's just jenniferegan.com, right? Yeah. Um, go to there. Go to the front page. It's got the cover of Candy House there. And then you can chase around like this grid and the images come up behind it that are the colors of the cover. But then you can tap on quotes from out of the book. Well, basically, every you're looking at a piece of graph paper, and there's a lot of role-playing gaming in Candy House, so that's yeah. sort of where that arises. And each little smudge that you see is the first page of a chapter in the Candy House, and you can see which page it is by hovering. And then if you go to the first paragraph and click, the, the page as published will vanish, and you'll be looking at a marked-up manuscript of that same paragraph. And then if you click on that, you'll end up with my first draft of that paragraph, which is always dated. Um, and sometimes there are funny notes. Like I, I always record how many pages I wrote that day, and my goal is five to seven. So th there's one where it says five pages, yay. <laughs> um, so it's very much, you know, it was certainly not intended for public consumption um, originally. But then, in a way, the, the better thing is, there were a lot of, not a lot, but there were several cases where I had a lot of false starts before I got to the first paragraph that really led to the finished version. And I've included the, the first drafts of those ill-fated attempts as well. So you can keep going deeper than the handwritten first draft of the published version in a few cases. And, you know, in a way it's, it's kind of, I mean, when my, I mean, first of all, I don't know a thing about designing websites. The coolness of this is not due to me at all. It's these, um, this amazing team that I've worked with for ages on websites. And my Manhattan Beach website and Goon Squad website are archived within mm -hmm. this site, and they designed those too. They're equally cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. But they, when I, we were working on this, they said, um, are you totally sure you want people to be reading this stuff, like these failed drafts? And I thought, well, first of all, my handwriting is really hard to read. Um, but second of all, there is a kind of intimidating finished look to a book that I even find intimidating, even when I wrote the book. So I like demystifying that in every way possible. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know what, if this makes people feel more hope that their work could end up being a book, fine. And that it took, what did you say, 10 years from starting Candy House? You said 2010 to 20... Well, 11 years. 11 years. I, but, you know, I wrote Manhattan Beach. We, yes, time, yeah. But, but, you, yeah. But just to get that idea, I think, um, you know, as newer writers, which I'm one of them as well, um, I think it's great to know the pro some of the process. Like, really, it takes draft after draft. It takes sometimes putting things to the side and going back to them and going back and forth and really putting your own fresh eyes, even, on that project. Very much so. I mean... I write my first drafts without a plan, and but after that, I, I tend to edit on manuscripts and type in my changes, which allows me to number my drafts. Mm -hmm. And it is not uncommon to have, I mean, I, I think my top number is maybe 70. That's really high. Um, but in, in the Candy House, 35, 40 is average. That sounds more shocking than it really is. If you think about it, if you're editing on a screen, if you count each time you start from the beginning and go back through as a new draft, the drafts start to, you know, the number starts to climb. Mm -hmm. I think we don't perceive that when we're editing in, yeah. uh, sort of continuously. 
but it can be very nice to have a record, um, partly because sometimes in editing we lose good stuff and many times I have gone back, because I save obviously all the hard copies until I'm done with the project, I have dug back down and excavated through hard copies of draft to try to find material that I somehow lost along the way or you know, edit it out when I really needed it. Mm. So I'm, I'm a big fan of keeping a paper trail, a, like a literal paper trail, because <laughs> if you don't have it, it's, you don't, you know, it's not there if mm -hmm. you need it. Uh, thank you. It, it actually it feels much better when I think about how many drafts I go through for things, and I'm like, oh no, okay, good, good. I'm with an, I'm, 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 I'm feel much better about that because I go through a lot. Um, There's no shame. I, <laughs> at all. I mean, really, I think it's impressive to, to, you know. And one thing I often say to people because they feel like it's taking so long, and I am a very impatient person, so I really understand that. But one thing I say, and I truly believe this, is. It actually does not matter how long it takes mm -hmm. if it's good. Right. It's so hard to do anything good. And work that is really good leaps to the front. And if, if an extra year is the difference between good and great, that year is nothing. That is a tiny price mm -hmm. to pay to close that gap. Uh, we were talking about AWP right before we came in here. And uh, this was my second year going to AWP. It was my first time actually getting to a panel because I'm working when I'm there for Barzak. Um, I got to a panel and it was about linked short stories. And because that's what I'm working on and I was dying to see the panel and uh, you came up during from the audience, not from the panelists. The panelists actually were like, we're, we're not gonna answer for her, we're not her. We don't know anything about decisions behind the book. But the the couple of the audience members were like, "Well, how come she, hers are titled novels and not short story collections?" And so I was curious about the thought process behind it being labeled as a novel versus a short story collection. Was that a decision you made right from the start, or was it something that your editors made? Um, so there's a fun answer to that. So when I when I finished Goon Squad, I thought. Uh, I don't know if people who w want to read a novel are going to feel that this is a novel. Mm -hmm. So I insisted that they not put novel on the cover. The editor insisted that they not put short stories on the cover because short story collections, I think, traditionally don't sell as well. Mm -hmm. That was the feeling. So we were a little bit at a standstill, so we put nothing on the cover. That oh. was the solution. And on the cover was a picture of a guitar, and it just said, A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan. This was a marketing error, um, although whose <laughs> error it was depends who you ask. Uh, the bottom line is no one wanted to buy this book. Some people thought it was nonfiction about music, because I also am a journalist. Uh -huh. The bottom line is no one knew what it was, and so they, they just didn't purchase it. And the book did horribly. So, in paperback, uh, my editor basically said, guess what, we're calling it a novel. Hmm. Um, and the truth was that in reviews, it had been, it seemed to be generally referred to as a novel, and I was happy to concede because I wanted it to sell better. Mm -hmm. So, it really is just a marketing decision. Right. I mean, who cares? You know, labels are always... Um, misleading to some mm -hmm. degree. They are categories that are useful for other purposes. Mm -hmm. And that is certainly true of marketing labels. But the bottom line is, you know, it, it, not designating your book as anything, I think is not a great idea. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know. know. <laughs> I never have known what, what they are. They're, they're, they're works of fiction. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I guess no one wants to put that on a cover. That is, I think it's so interesting when you start to look at those questions about where things get end up in the, the bookstore on the shelf and making it almost easy for the, the customer to buy it, not so much necessarily worrying about it from the writer's end, but that's about how to connect to the reader. And that's such an interesting part of the process that we, we don't always think about as we're writing things. So I think that's fascinating. Um, I also, on that panel was, uh, Carmen Maria Marchado, who wrote, if you guys don't know her, she wrote um, Her Body and Other Parties, which is amazing. And uh, she spent a couple minutes just talking about 
how painstakingly she structured the stories within the book. She had a plan with how, with the, the order she wanted her stories to go in for the reader to have an experience. You, neither of these books are chronological or alphabetized or anything like that. So how, how did you pick the order that those stories were gonna go into? That is one of the hardest things and, and the last thing that mm -hmm. became clear in both cases. So with A Visit from the Moon Squad, I actually had a wrong idea about structure. I thought the chronology would go straight backwards. Mm -hmm. Even though I wasn't writing the stories in that order, I thought, oh, this the fun of this, and it, it is a governing idea in both books, that instead of the the surprise or the the hope of surprise that's that's guiding us being what's going to happen the the curiosity that i'm answering more often than not is something like "Ooh, what was that like and then we find out so i thought okay so the whole thing is going to work that way now other people have done it it was not a new idea <laughs> um, but not that many and i thought it'll be great i can't wait uh, so i worked in these stories and in, in various uh, orders and then I and I worked on them very individually because I w wanted them to feel different from each other and as mm -hmm. I said that was one of those ideas that came about accidentally but I really liked it and wanted to didn't I didn't want them to sort of bleed into each other if you will so I put them in that backwards order um, close to the end or what I thought was the end and I read them through and I had a very unpleasant experience because what I found was that the book was very flat. It did hmm. not gain momentum. It seemed to lose momentum as I went, not the effect one hopes for when reading a book. Yeah. So I thought, okay, what's wrong here? Um, maybe it's just not a very good book. That's one possibility. But I also noticed that the backwards chronology was actually undermining certain surprises and rewards that I felt the reader might have had if the stories were juxtaposed differently. So just to give you one example, there's the mention in chapter two, uh, which the protagonist of chapter two is a music producer, and there's a mention of the fact that he was in a punk rock band as a teenager. And in fact, I wrote the chapter in which he is in the punk rock band shortly thereafter because I thought, oh, this will be kind of fun. Yeah, Benny in a band, what was that like? In my backwards chronology, we have to get from 2006 to 1979. We have mm -hmm. to wait eight chapters to see Benny in that band. And guess what? No one remembers by then mm -hmm. that little moment when we learned that he was in a band. The time to, to, to jump into that moment is right after we hear about it. Right. So what I realized was chronology was at odds with satisfying curiosity. Mm -hmm. It was at cross purposes with it. And these books are structured around the satisfaction of curiosity. So not all of my books are, but in, the, in these cases, that is what works. And so when I started Candy House, and, and so well, just to finish about Goon Squad, so in a way my organizing principle was what should what would be the most fun thing for the reader to encounter having just read this okay and in a way it was disappointing because in my backwards chronology the first half of the book took place after 9-11 and the second half took place before 9-11 and that conceptually was really cool mm -hmm. so i lost that but it was worth it because I gained more than I lost. And I, I think in these kind of, for a very non-business oriented person, I think very much in terms of cost benefit analysis when I'm making craft choices. Because you gain and lose with every choice you make. Mm -hmm. And the question is always, are you gaining enough to justify what you're losing? Mm -hmm. So for example, think about first person. What you gain is intimacy you're really deep inside someone's sensibility. What you lose is every other point of view. So you'd better be deep enough and getting enough out of that intimate point of view to justify what you're losing. Mm. That's the, I, I think about that a lot. So in the case of Goon Squad, it definitely was worth it to lose backwards chronology, even though I also lost my cool conceptual 9-11 uh, kind of pivot in the middle. 
With the candy house, I thought, well, let's see what happens. But it was very clear that I never thought it would go in chronological order. Mm. Um, I, again, structured it really around curiosity. That's, yeah. And that is not arbitrary. In other words, I do not encourage you to read these chapters in a different order. I can promise you it won't be as good. These, <laughs> these are very careful decisions. Yeah, that's what Carmen said about her book when people would come up and say, oh, I read... I, I jumped around when I read it and I didn't like your book very much and she said, okay, read it over again from start to finish and to come back and tell me what you think. First and of all, why someone is telling her that, I don't I know. know but. <laughs> she said it's happened a couple times. She was like, read it over, start over again. Um, and, and speaking of, of characters, actually I wanted to ask about characters. You have so many characters. I, I would like to say that I was... Um, uh, nitpicky enough to actually sit down and count them, but there was no way I was going to sit down and count all the characters between the two books. I haven't even done that. I so. know, I know. I thought about it, though. So uh, there are so many, and Sasha being one of my absolute favorites and watching her um, evolution from the start of Goon Squad into, you know, lifting the wallet to having this art that she's creating in the desert with the balloons looking... I, I, it's a beautiful evolution of Sasha. I just I don't know why she was my favorite. I can't tell you why, but I loved her. Um, each of these characters are with so many of them. They don't feel like copies of each other, which I, I, I it's with so many. It, it's, it would be so easy to have a couple who almost looked alike. How did you get so many distinctive characters who feel real and and like people you want to follow? It's, I always have a hard time, I, I don't use people I know, mm. and I don't ever write about myself, at least not knowingly, except to the degree that all of them are me, and right. I'm all of them, and we're all the same person, all right. of us in the world. Um, so it, it's always a little hard for me to say how, sort of where the characters come from, mm -hmm. if you will, except that to get back to the kind of improvisational method that I use, with my early drafts, I think one reason I use it is that it helps so much with character. So if you think about improvisation, think about comic improv, for example, by the way, none of which I've ever done because I've never acted, but I've watched it. It's a bunch of people kind of leaning into a line of action mm -hmm. in which automatically a, a bunch of characters emerge in relation to that action. That's kind of how it happens for me. I, I start with a time and a place. So I start with a physical environment mm -hmm. and nothing more. And the first question is, who is perceiving that environment? Because someone must be. What point of view are we in? And that is the first in inkling I have of character. We're inside someone's head seeing these details. And then who else is there? So that that immediately is the beginning of more characters. And as I write, I'm looking for what seems most interesting about these people as they emerge mm -hmm. and kind of going with that. So I guess the reason that hopefully they don't remind you of each other is that I am also looking to find people who are not like other people in the book or mm -hmm. any other books that I've written. So I'm looking for exactly those points of difference that will hopefully help me not repeat myself. Mm -hmm. And if I have a sense that I'm repeating myself, I, I recoil from it. I really, it's, it, it, it's almost a feeling of revulsion. And I think that's why I really don't like to write about myself or, or people who remind me of me because it's that feeling of repetition. You know, I mentioned at mm. the beginning that sense of transcending my own life and the limitations of my life and my identity is exactly what's fun about writing fiction. Mm -hmm. So if I start to feel like I'm just treading the same ground that I'm treading in my life as a human, that is, is antithetical to the feeling that I want to achieve. And I'll just say a couple of things about what I look for when I'm, when I'm writing characters, because I get it wrong a lot, too, and have to fix things. Mm -hmm. One idea is contradiction. You know, the consistent character, except, I mean, there are certain exceptions, but 
you know, in nineteenth-century fiction, there are some consistent characters who really work. But on the whole, in a contemporary environment, I'm looking for people's contradictions. Mm -hmm. And in general, if if I've seen someone doing one thing, I don't want to keep seeing that person doing that thing. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in *A Visit from the Goon Squad*, we see Sasha stealing. That's sort of her most memorable practice, mm -hmm. I would say, in the book. And then we we recognize that she you know she leaves that compulsion behind as she gets older, and we see her you know being a mom. But there's no way I was going to have Sasha doing the same thing in the Candy House. Mm -hmm. And I didn't sit down and think, well, what should Sasha do? I imagined forward thinking, what would be, what would, what, what would be a future that would be linked to that practice and yet transform it into something different? And the obvious idea was art. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm always looking to work against what I've already done with someone. So for example, there's one person who's a major character in both books, only one, a guy named Lou Klein. And a lot of people found him the least sympathetic character in Goon Squad. He's a guy who's <laughs> made a wreckage of his family life, mm -hmm. left you know, ex-wives and damaged children in his wake. Very easy guy not to like. And I, that makes me very curious about him. Both what made him, there were a few questions that weren't answered in Goon Squad. One was, how, who, what made him who he is? Mm -hmm. And another is, who conquers him? Mm -hmm. We see him conquering a lot of people. And I guess those were, I didn't ask those questions explicitly, but those are the questions I tried to answer in writing again about Lou in the Candy House. So contradiction, working against what I've already established, and following details that seem like they'll lead me somewhere that I haven't been before into, into the world of a person I haven't written about before. Those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about and, and working toward when I write about characters. I love that. I, I love that you're sort of looking at how to create sort of new characters you haven't read before, but also you do it with some forms as well. I, I, the three chapters I'm specifically thinking of are Lulu the Spy 2032, um, See Below, which by the way is amazing if you haven't read the book yet see below it's just emails back and forth to people and it tells an entire story through emails of people going back and forth and from goon squad great rock and roll pauses i want to say pulses because it felt like it goes with rock and roll but pauses so these structures and one of the one of the pages you can click on i think it's the one that says five pages yay on it is the lulu chapter where it if you go back in those drafts, you see these little boxes you created on the page. So what was sort of in getting from these little boxes and what was the thought about these boxes and then getting it to the story that we read in Candy House today? Well, that uh, Lulu the Spy was the first chapter I actually wrote of the oh. Candy House. And I started it right after I finished Goon Squad. I never thought it could be part of Goon Squad, but I was already thinking um, there were a few different things that led me to it, one of which was I just wanted to try to use Twitter as a storytelling form. And this was Twitter at 140 characters. So it, Twitter at 140 characters read quite differently than Twitter does now mm. because it was really the difference between a structural unit that was closer to a sentence and a structural unit that is closer to a paragraph. Mm -hmm. So Twitter now doesn't read as unusually as it did before, and I'm sure that's why they changed it, because it really was sort of, it was a, a, it was a real restriction to be limited to 140 characters. And there was a little, there was a kind of inadvertent poetry, I mm -hmm. felt sometimes, to Twitter, utter, to tweets, because of the effort of compressing mm -hmm. whatever it was into 140 characters. And I also am a huge fan of 19th century fiction, uh, which one of, one of the things that I love about it is that it was, much of it was written to be serialized. So it has a lot of storytelling qualities that we tend to look for in television nowadays. Yeah. Namely, a big cast of characters who go in and out of focus, a big story arc that you almost don't have to keep track of to enjoy individual episodes. 
um, a, a, a big, wide landscape of action. Um, so I love all of that. And I, when I read Twitter, I thought it would be interesting to try to serialize something in 140 character units. So I was thinking about all of those structural things. Um, and, the, and so I thought, well, I'm going to try to write something for Twitter. Uh, it took a while to find a story that I, or to even find a landscape that I thought I could approach in these small structural units. But I had also been thinking, I love genre fiction, um, and I, I, was, I love the spy genre in fiction, movies, any, any sort of art form. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was feeling like a spy relaying her mission in short bulletins mm -hmm. could be a kind of environment that would be fun and doable in these short units. So it's interesting that you mentioned the notebook, which, as Christy says, you can actually see if you peel back through the layers um, of Lulu the Spy to, the, um, to this notebook that I used. The notebook was crucial mm -hmm. because when I, I usually write on legal pads and when I first started working on that chapter or that, that story, I thought it was a novella initially, these long gangly sentences really didn't look right mm -hmm. and I kind of felt like I couldn't continue with sentences looking that way. They were too dangly and long. So I was visiting a book club for a visit from the Goon Squad. They had read a visit from the Goon Squad, so I was visiting them, and a woman was taking notes in a notebook that had rectangles. And I thought, I said, where did you get that? And she said she'd gotten it at Muji. Hmm. So I raced to Muji, got my own notebook with rectangles, and found that writing in the rectangles felt much more freeing and somehow hmm. more appropriate to this project than writing on a pad of paper yeah. with long lines. So I just wrote it by hand in this notebook as I would anything um, over the course of, a, I don't know, a couple of months. The first page is there so you can see it. I was on my book tour for Goon Squad and in fact I dropped guacamole all over one page because I was eating alone in a, in a Mexican restaurant. So. That, that's another funny thing about physical artifacts. They really do bear physical traces of what was going on. Um, but anyway, so that was really the beginning of, hmm. that, of that chapter. Um, it ended up being tweeted, uh, at, tweeted and run by The New Yorker, and it really was tr tweeted in a serialized fashion, which hmm. was kind of cool, over 10 nights for an hour a night. Wow. Um, but it wasn't, I don't think it was a huge success on Twitter because they did, they tweeted once a minute, which I think was too slow. Oh. Um, but again, this was 2012, so another era Twitter-wise. Um, and, uh, and, and then they also ran it as a, a kind of a novella called Black Box, and it's been reduced for um, the candy house. Mm. Uh, that's such an interesting way to think about how stories can change over time. If it was put out on Twitter, what you said, one a minute, and then it was reduced down to Black Box, and then it became Lulu the Spy. So no, before, Black Box was it, Black Box is the Twitter version. Oh, is the Twitter yeah. version? And okay. it's. I mean, all I mean is that I compressed it slightly gotcha. more for um, for the book. But it's you know it's Lulu for right. sure, and the story elements are are all the same and. Some of the other thing, I mean, that, that is kind of the linchpin of the candy house because mm -hmm. one of the things I wondered about, so Lulu is on her spy mission, and this is a, an interesting craft topic, really, which is what does genre do? Right. And the thing about genre is there are a couple of things it does that I love. One is it provides an environment. So, and, and it's, a, it's a, a literary environment, and I, in my mind, literary includes film, television, and everything else. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I wrote a gothic thriller called The Keep, mm. and I started it exactly as I always do, with a sense of environment. It's just that it wasn't a real world environment. It was the gothic is a literary environment. My first exposure to it was from a very cheesy soap opera that I used to watch when my mom was at home called Dark Shadows, <laughs> um, which I think has a sort of weird cult following now. Mm -hmm. It was terrible, <laughs> but it was very gothic. Mm -hmm. There were people coming out of coffins. There were identical twins played by the same actress. 
you name it, dark pools and an old castle. Um, <laughs> So it had all. It, it's amazing how many of this, how the tropes of the Gothic are so consistent. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so the, so genre pro can provide a ready-made environment, and it also can it can help the writer focus the reader on certain things, and therefore lets the writer get away with not dealing with other things. So here's an example: murder mysteries. Murder mysteries are not about grieving. Death is terrible and leaves mm -hmm. an enormous gaping loss in its wake, as probably all of us know. That is not the focus of a murder mystery. And if you pick up a murder mystery and you kind of descend into a well of grieving, my guess is you're going to start thinking, I don't know about this murder mystery <laughs> because this is a genre that's about problem solving. It's mm -hmm. about finding out who did it, not about wallowing in the impact of the death. Mm -hmm. So with the spy genre, what I found was that I was able to, terrible things happen to Lulu in the course of her mission. Yeah. She is raped, she is shot, she nearly dies, I mean it's, a nightmare yeah and it's not that I don't I don't deny any of that we can we can see it's happening and it's I think adds a dimension of yeah. gravitas but it I remain within the genre in that we're really reading for the action and we mm -hmm. want to know what's going to happen and how is she going to get out of this mm -hmm. but I also knew that if I were going to include this in a book and if there was going to be a book this would have to be in it I would actually have to reckon with the severity of what Lulu had gone through without the genre, a genre to protect me, and to make it easy to to make it easy for me to not reckon with these things. And mm -hmm. that ended up being the single biggest challenge mm -hmm. of this book. And you'll see the layers of that challenge <laughs> if you start with C below mm -hmm. the chapter Christy was just mentioning, which is all email and go down through the layers, yeah. you'll see that what I originally thought I was going to do, which conceptually made a lot of sense, on her mission, Lulu is narrating her lessons that she's learned from each step she takes mm. in the form of thought bulletins, which she is transmitting via a device the government has implanted in her brain. So I thought, so Lulu comes back, she has twins, and you know, anyone who's been through this is going to be pretty severely traumatized and have to grapple with that. And I thought, I know, what if she can't stop narrating her mission in these thought bulletins, even though the device is no longer in her brain and she's no longer on a mission? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get another notebook at Muji and I'm going to start that story of her domestic life narrated in the same way that mm -hmm. I narrated her mission. It was one of those great ideas that reminds me of why my ideas are not great <laughs> <laughs> and why I need to write improvisationally to get around my ideas. Mm. Because the bottom line was this very same notebook approach device that felt so freeing writing about Lulu's mission and seemed to allow me to include humor, pathos, to move around through time and to adopt various voices became like a straitjacket when I tried to employ it in Lulu's domestic life. However, I was so enamored of my concept that I really tried, I stuck with it and I filled up a whole notebook. And this is why I have a writing group in part. And I actually dedicated the candy house to them. Mm -hmm. And you guys are in an environment in which it is prime uh, territory to locate possible future writing group yeah. members. Um, anyway, what I found when I brought this in and read it to them, because we only read aloud, they would find that there were some utterances that were compelling, but really it just, it just wasn't alive. It mm -hmm. just wasn't working. So I finally jettisoned that. That was months of effort that did not work. And I had a new idea, which I, you can also see in the sequence, um, which is the second to last layer, which is, I know, what if I write a chapter in the form of therapist's notes 
by Lulu's therapist. How about that? I didn't get far with that. I felt like I couldn't <laughs> do a thing with that. Um, and so I, I thought, you know, if I can't solve this, I can't include Black Box. Mm -hmm. And if I can't include Black Box, I don't think I have a book. So this is where the stakes start to feel pretty high. Mm -hmm. And then somehow, I guess I, I'm not sure exactly. I also knew that I wanted to try to write an epistolary chapter, mm -hmm. a chapter in the form of letters, which is as old as the novel itself, and, and it, which is a genre that lets the writer do a lot of things. We're, we're in lots of first-person points of view. We're watching people manipulate each other. There's kind of inherent humor in, in epistolary work because we, the reader always knows so much more than mm -hmm. any other people in the, in the story. And I guess somehow I thought, what if I start with Lulu's husband writing a letter about her? Mm -hmm. And I started writing that letter and I had the feeling that I live for and hope for, which is a sense of doors opening rather than closing. And what I found was that by bringing in lots of other voices, I was able to do to absolutely attend to the really severe things that have happened to Lulu and the anguish they have caused in her. And it is a chapter about Lulu's attempt to solve that anguish. And yet, I also was able to, you know, there's a lot of humor in there and a lot of other things going on. And in fact, this is what I, another, this is a craft tenet of mine. The best solutions creatively, I think this is probably true across all genres, the best solutions usually solve more than one problem. Because mm. if you've really found the right solution that is organically suited to the project you're working on, it will likely fill other gaps and solve mm -hmm. other problems that you have. If it's really inherent, it, sh it probably will do that. And so what this chapter did for me, in addition to solving my Lulu problem, was that it actually let me have kind of a reunion, mm -hmm. even though I was so determined that there wouldn't be a hokey reunion where yeah. everyone's called into the same room, I was able to bring a lot of voices into mm -hmm. one chapter. Yeah. It shows how connected to all the little worlds are between each other. Um, and, and Sasha kind of played that role, I noticed, in Goon Squad as well, how many people were somehow even adjacently connected to Sasha throughout that book. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to throw it out to the audience. I'm going to give you guys the heads up, then I'm going to throw it out in a minute. Um, I would really love it if you'd talk a bit about Pen America, just to share that um, with the, the writers in the room. Pen America is a hundred and two-year-old organization. Uh, well, Pen America is obviously limited to America, but Pen is a global organization dedicated to um, free expression, to, it's to, to celebrating literary culture and protecting the freedoms that make a robust literary culture yeah. possible. And so we do all manner of things from cataloging the number of writers that are imprisoned around the world and working hard to free them um, here in America to combating book bans, which are wildly on the rise right now, yeah. um, and to protecting speech in all kinds of ways, uh, on campuses, um, both on the right and the left, mm -hmm. um, trying to combat uh, tools for combating online harassment, all the things that hamper free speech and free expression um, are things that we try to uh, provide tools to handle. Um, and also just celebrating literary expression because in this country we wor worry about whether people are reading enough, but in countries with autocrats, mm -hmm. writers are worrying about whether their words are going to get them thrown in jail. No one questions how important writing is in places where there is not democratic rule, which is a reminder of how important literature really is to the development of a strong citizenry and an active mind, mm. an active and free thinking mind, which is what autocracies do not want because that makes their job harder. So it's an organization that, that speaks to all of that 
um, in many, many ways and, and champions younger writers, new writers, writers of every sort, um, and, and tries as best it can to let them keep writing. Thank you. All right. Who has a question? And do you guys need micro? Do we need to pass the microphone around? Okay, so shout it out. Um, <clears throat> and we'll repeat it. Hi, yeah. I'm Henry. I'm, um, I'm in high school. You're one of my biggest inspirations. <gasps> Yay! Really books. Uh, I ran over here from school. Um, <laughs> so I'm curious. I know your work was inspired by Proust, and that's something I'm trying to get through. Um, <laughs> um, but. You know, it both conveys a feeling of time passing uh, over long spans of time, decades, years, uh, even when readers are sitting in one room for 30 minutes at a time and they don't have that kind of long passage, right? So how do you stylistically convey, I mean, you have chapters, three chapters that can span 30 years and that a reader might spend 45 minutes on, right? How do you convey so much growth and longevity when a reader is on the same couch in the same hour? So this is Henry, who came over from high school, which I really appreciate. <laughs> um, and well, so one thing Henry mentions that um, he's finding it hard to get through Proust. I could not <laughs> read Proust even in my early 20s because I thought, who cares about time? Um, I mean, the romance part I liked. Um, so I ended up reading In Search of Lost Time in a book club, and it took us six years. And we were all in our 30s, and we had we had five children among us in the time that it took us to read In Search of Lost Time. So it was a real time experience for us. Right, um, right. And we were kind of permanently bonded by it. So Henry's question is how I think, and tell me if I've got it right, how, do, how does a writer manipulate time to suggest the passage of 30 years to someone who's sitting and reading that particular um, passage in 45 minutes. Okay, so time, the relationship between time and fiction is, is so interesting. Mm -hmm. I think you could say that fiction is always about time passing on some level. I think this is actually what separates it from poetry, it, one of the things. You know, whether it's a minute or an hour or a day, as in Ulysses, Time passes and things happen, and that's kind of what makes it fiction. Um, and so the manipulation of that passage of time is one of the basic jobs of the fiction writer. In terms of, I mean, I, it's funny because I don't, I don't think about how to express the passage of time per se as I'm writing. I think maybe that's one of those things that is, you know, how much time is going to pass in a work of art is one of those very basic questions, sort of like first person, third person, um, you know, it's, it's very basic. But I don't know that I make that choice right away as I'm working or whether it comes about spontaneously and becomes clear as I work. But I will say, Maybe I'll answer your question. To give you a specific answer, I'll say that it, a visit from the Goon Squad I knew would be a response to Proust in some way. I was, it, you know, I was thinking about it as I, as we were reading this book so slowly in my book club and having children <laughs> along the way. I was thinking, I love the fact that this book is about time passing explicitly because it's 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 foregrounding something that all fiction is about and making it a sort of extra subject of, of the novel. How could I do that very same thing but not require so many thousands of pages and a kind of real-time experience of time passing? And I, I didn't know what the answer was. It was just a question that I had kind of rattling around in my head. In those same years, I was watching The Sopranos. So I don't watch a lot of television, but I am interested in serialization as a storytelling structure. Um, and I tend to get most of my serialization from 19th century fiction. But The Sopranos was amazing and to me, very literary in that I felt like it, the, the, all of it was embedded so deeply in my head. It felt like it lived more where fiction lives rather than television, which I tend to find lives on a more surface level for me. And so I think 
And so I found myself thinking, how can I do what The Sopranos does? How can I use the, the serialization elements in a work of fiction? So those two questions were in my head. And I think somehow they combined so that my answer to the question of how to convey so much time passing in a non-real-time unfolding, the answer to that question seemed to be using a fragmented story st structure that evokes serialization. And that is real, those were the two structural ideas behind A Visit from the Goon Squad. And so I guess the answer to your question of how to manipulate, how to suggest a long passage of time in a short, in a short space, if you will, for me was in that case fragmentation. Hmm. Hi, I'm John. Uh, I actually go to Binghamton and I'm getting my master's and I'm doing an independent study right now. And this book is actually part of the books that I read. And I just wrote a paper on, on March 13th. And with the paper, I wrote about Sasha. And one of the things that was interesting in, in reading it, it's the second time I've read the novel. And at the first time I hadn't noticed this, in chapter one, we learn a few things about Sasha that become relevant to Rob. And the first one is that there's a photograph of Rob that her date notices but doesn't mention. And the second thing is, in that first chapter, in a conversation with her therapist about her kleptomania, she says, I don't think about the people. And I was wondering, um, this is, what you know, sort of what my paper was about, about when she gets to Rob, is she thinking about Rob through her actions? And when you're writing that, those little hints in the beginning, was that part of this, you know, you know, part of the little Easter egg that you were dropped, and how did that relate to that that story? Okay, I'm trying to think about how to paraphrase this question. I think this this <laughs> questioner might know my book slightly better than I do, right? This minute. <laughs> um, it's about it's about certain little moments in chapter one of A Visit from the Goon Squad that suggest things that happen later um, involving Sasha, one of the two main characters. And one of, the comments, one of the comments that Sasha makes to her therapist is, I don't think about the people, but it's in the context of her stealing. So she has a compulsion to steal, and her therapist, and she's, you know, this is getting into her into a lot of trouble. Ultimately, it gets her fired from a job. I mean, who on earth wants a person who's stealing everything to be working for them? It's not a good trait to have from an employer's standpoint. Um, and her therapist asks her whether she thinks about the people that she's stealing from as a way of, I think, trying to evoke her empathy for them as a way of getting her to stop doing it. And she says, I don't think about the people. And I think that that's her way of um, making it easier to fulfill her compulsion. Um, if she doesn't think about the impact of her theft, then it's easier to go ahead and do it. I'm not sure I can, I, I, don't, I, I think that what I'm gonna do to answer this question is tell you a little bit about the order in which I wrote those chapters. So in a lot of cases, I am finding little clues in what I'm writing and following them into other material. Um, so for example, I mentioned earlier that there's a music producer, we know he was in a punk band. I was curious about what that punk band was like and so then I wrote about the punk band. The, I, did, I did not know about Rob, Sasha's friend who drowned when they were in college when I wrote that first chapter. In fact, Rob came very late into the narrative because I wanted very much to see Sasha in college and I couldn't find a way to get to her. And that's one of these big problems in books in which each chapter has a different protagonist. If I want to see someone again, but they can't be the protagonist, I mean, suddenly I'm kind of getting forced into really contorted shapes to try to right to try to get to the moments I'm trying to get to. So I wanted to see Sasha in college so badly that I actually considered breaking my rule of having every chapter be about a different person and letting her be a protagonist again. And I wrote that, but it wasn't all that good. It was sort of okay. So 
It was a long and winding road to arrive at Rob, a friend of hers in college who ends up drowning. Um, and, and once I finally arrived at him at, as a protagonist, which also, speaking of solutions solving more than one problem, I had desperately wanted to use the second person in A Visit from the Goon Squad. So you do this, you do that. Second person is a fascinating form because we use it all the time in normal conversation. Start listening for it. I'll, I'm sure I'll use it as we're talking. People tend to use it when they are describing things that suddenly feel really personal. We slip into the second person to distance that personal material from ourselves. And I noticed that as a journalist because second person quotes are not great. You, you, okay, so here I am. I'm now slipping into the second person. You tend to want first person quotes as a journalist, but often someone will be saying, yeah, I lost my job and it, and it was really painful. You know, you feel really bad when you lose your job. You feel like you're never gonna find another job. Mm -hmm. And as the journalist, I'm really bummed out because now just as the person is describing this very personal stuff, they're distancing themselves from it by using the second person. So the second person is fascinating, but very hard to employ in fiction. Mm -hmm. And I had tried it a few different ways and I couldn't do it. When I arrived at Rob, Sasha's friend, I was able to use the second person, so I was thrilled. But because there had been no Rob, I, had, I did go back through and actually pl I plant those little Easter eggs, if you will, to lead us to Rob in that early chapter. All right, we're gonna wrap it up uh, because we were enjoying ourselves too much and now we've run out of time. So please give a big hand to I'm also Jennifer. happy to be talking outside. For those she is very happy to talk to you outside.